Everyone thought 2019 was the all-time high for energy and oil demand and that coming back out of COVID, yeah, we would come back and normalize, but never at the rates we saw. 2022 set the new record. I mean, you couldn't have been wronger faster. Hello, everyone. Chris Martinson of Peak Prosperity here today. Very special guest. We are talking with Mr. Adam Rosenswag of Gehring and Rosenswag, a fundamental research firm focused exclusively on natural resource investments. They have over nine years of combined experience. He, Adam has nine years experience in that sector. And uh, having worked with the bulk of his nine years of investment experience with exclusively on the Global Natural Resources Fund at Chilton Investment Company with Mr. Gehring. I am deeply familiar with their work, having both consumed and discussed their incredible quarterly commentaries on such things as modeling U.S. shale oil output and all of which you can access by navigating to GoRosen, G-O-R-O-Z-E-N, GoRosen.com. You can find their commentaries there. Adam, welcome to the program. Thank you. Happy to be here, Chris, and happy to talk with you today. I'll just start by by correcting one uh, thing. Um, I'm actually uh, up to 17 years of experience in the natural resources uh, investment space, and my partner has been doing this for 31, 32 years. So together we have, what is that, almost 50 years uh, of, of combined natural resource investment experience. Um, so wow. something got cached a while ago in one of the Google searches, but yeah, no, we're up to 17 years. We started Gehring and Rosenzweig back in 2016, so that's been going on eight years. Maybe that's what it is, but no, we've been doing this a long, long time. Oh, great. Well, thanks for the correction. I, I love to be accurate. So, uh, yes, a lot of experience in there. Um, Adam, before we dive into all the nitty-gritty details, which I love to do, can we please, let's set the stage for people whose brains maybe aren't totally as coded in oil as yours and mine. Uh, what is Hubbard's peak, right? And second, is peak oil more of a theory or is it more of an objective description of reality? How, how, how do you describe that? Well, what, what an interesting question, a good place to start off, and we could probably fill the whole hour just talking about you know history and, yeah. and that whole bit. Um, so Hubbard's peak was a series of, um, or a lifetime, an embodiment of work done by a shell geologist named King Hubbard. Uh, he very famously or infamously, depending on what time of frame you're looking at, uh, got up in front of, uh, I, I think it was, I, I always thought it was the Society of Petroleum Engineers, but I think it was actually the American Petroleum Institute uh, in their annual gala, and, and delivered a speech, and this would have been in the late 1950s, if I'm not mistaken, about his concepts around peak oil. And those, um, that, that speech, his work, his writings, ha- have all eponymously been, been referred to as Hubbard's Peak. And really what it refers to is the idea that the output, meaning the flow rate, you know, barrels per day of a given oil field, bears some relationship to the total recoverable reserves of that field. That makes a lot of sense intuitively, you know, the idea that a small little isolated oil pool uh, somewhere, let's say, in the Western Canadian sedimentary basin won't be able to produce 5 million barrels a day for two weeks. You know, it'll produce at some slower rate, right? And a a big super major field uh, like Gawar uh, will be able to sustain many millions of barrels for a long period of time. So the size of the reserves impacts the production profile of the field. And that's really what Hubbard's peak is at its at its core. Now, the big takeaway from that was another conclusion that Hubbard reached, which was very, very criticized both in his life and uh, afterwards. And that revolves around the peak part of it, which is to say, when will any given field peak, reach its maximum production, and then begin to roll over? And what Hubbard hypothesized was that and this is important, under unconstrained field development, so meaning no lack of capital, no lack of mm-hmm. equipment, no lack of takeaway capacity, an idealized field should follow what basically looks like a bell-shaped curve. It's going to ramp up. It's going to ramp up at an ever-accelerating rate, hit an inflection point. It's going to keep growing, but grow at slower and slower rates, reach a peak, plateau, and then fall on the right-hand side of that curve in basically a profile that more or less mimics the ramp up phase. Now, again, that that was super controversial. It kind of makes intuitive sense, right? If you had to kind mm-hmm. of ask a college level math student, not knowing anything about geology or anything else, what should it look like? You'd say, okay, well, it has a finite 
uh, recoverable reserve and, and probably like everything or like many things in nature will follow something that looks like a like a bell-shaped curve and Hubbard used these theories and these teachings and these hypotheses to predict that the United States he actually made two predictions he kind of hedged his bets a little bit but he said that the United States would peak now remember at that point the United States would have been a huge growth driver in global crude production uh, and he said that it would peak uh, I think it was either 1970, and then his second prediction was 1972, and he and he tried to actually peak, pick the peak production rate of the United States. Now that, that's really really audacious, considering you know the U.S. is made up of you know hundreds and hundreds of oil fields around the country, um, and you know all different types. At that point, we didn't have the shales, but all different types of uh, geologies, lithologies, and things like that. But nevertheless, he put this out there, and sure enough, right on cue, the U.S. in the early 1970s peaked. And rolled over, and that was like a really kind of golden gonna, moment I'm just for gonna, Hubbard. Adam, let me just throw this up so that you can talk to it. I love this chart by Art Berman, uh, and the green part is conventional oil, and then we've got Alaska in yellow, blue is is offshore. The red is we'll talk about the red, the shales later. But but this uh, that peaks right there in 1970, right? That's exactly right, and that was exactly consistent with his initial predictions made you know, 20 years earlier, and all he was doing was taking his best estimate as to the recoverable reserves in the United States oil resource, and then from there using some very, very simple math to try to predict when that peak would come and at what rate. Mm -hmm. And so that green part, I would note, because I get in this, this discussion slash argument all the time, people say, oh, but technology advances so rapidly and I just want to take them and I want to say point to the green part where your technology has made a difference in this story. Mm -hmm. Right. And it has probably because we have more under that green than we otherwise might because technology's helped unlock more. But it didn't really change the trajectory, the dynamic of what you were talking about very much, did it? No. And I think that's a really important point because a lot of critics of Hubbard, I mean, several were made several criticisms were made straight away and then many more in the years that followed and one of the criticisms straight away which is kind of interesting which, which i always find fascinating is the idea that people really attacked him on his math they said look this is all empirical and observational and there's no kind of hard dot data and science behind it and, and i'm often drawn to things that sometimes you know have the the might lack some rigor but also have the funny ability of being right and predictive because we see that all the time right and then as we get deeper and deeper into a certain domain we begin to develop the knowledge that helps explain why that's happening but sometimes we just get these intuitive um these intuitive observations and in there and by studying those intuitive observations we actually get to the truth you know that that could have been said for uh, ancient astronomers as much as it could be for king hubbard you know the mathematics mm -hmm. behind uh you know orbital trajectories at the outset was probably incredibly, incredibly uh, lackadaisical, but then that created the inquiry and the curiosity that ultimately resulted in the knowledge that we have today as to why these things follow those tracks. So I think that's absolutely true. The other thing, though, that I think is really important, um, and if you want to kind of pull up that chart again, uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's a really um, nuanced point, but I think it's one that's, that's critically important, right? So if you look at the conventional lower 48, just that green shaded area, and you drew a perfect um, bell-shaped curve through that, uh, you would notice, you know, it's, it might not be apparent on the screen, but you would notice that the right-hand side of just the green has actually been stretched out a little bit, meaning that for mm -hmm. any given moment in time, we're producing more than an idealized Hubbard peak or an idealized uh, bell-shaped curve would Good point predict. And that is the power of technology. You can see it. You can almost quantify it. You can start to shade in the difference between an idealized normal curve and what you actually get. And that difference is the impact of technology. So it's there. It's very, very real. And thank goodness yeah. it is. However, what that was not able to do, technology was not able to create a new peak, a new all-time high, or even hold production flat. And that's something that I argue with people uh, all the time because, you know, people have said, well, you know, we're going, we're going to go from recovery factors, meaning how much of that recoverable oil, how much oil in place can actually be recovered, and it's quite low in the shales, and if we can just increase it a few more points, we'll unlock all this resource and reserve. And I point out to them that between 1970 and 2000, the U.S. like nearly tripled its recovery factor on its conventional base. You know, so it did, it, it, it lifted so, hit so far above its weight class, it did such a great job, and engineers were largely responsible for that, and it was great, mm -hmm. but it did not stop it from declining. Yeah. And let me tell you, you know, 
I always have to connect this one dot, and, and um, it's because of this. We're looking at a chart here with GDP in trillions globally up the left axis or Y axis and across the bottom on the X, um, thousands of barrels a day. So 90,000 would be 90 million barrels per day. And since the 70s, this is about as strong a chart as I have in all of economics. We've got a 93% explanatory factor, the R squared of 0.93, that says if you, if you gave me a mythical GDP, Adam, and said it's this big, I could tell you with reasonable accuracy how much oil it is consuming. There's a very strong correlation. Obviously, of course, you just look outside, you see all the cars, the trucks, the planes, the people moving, the restaurants, all of those funded by oil, as it were. So this is why it matters to me, because our entire financial system is basically saying, hey, we're going to have this continue forever. So I think we ought to have robust adult-sized conversations over what's forever. And I know this was a debate with Doomberg. He said, there's more than enough for more than long enough, which I take kind of a moral objection to, because it basically says, hey, our generation has no responsibility to people in the future. They'll work it out, right? Um, you know, but beyond that, I don't agree with that that there's more than enough long enough because there's all kinds of charts out there, which I'm sure you've seen even this one, right? Which is JP Morgan's own commodity desk saying, Hey, it looks like we have some trouble between here and 2030 ever widening trouble on this chart. Um, where do you stand on, on the oil supply issue and, and where we really are in the oil story? It's it's such a good question. It's a deep question, and and um, you know I, I I did do this discussion with Doomberg last week, and I think it was a mm-hmm. helpful framing. Um, we you know my view for those of you who have not listened to that was that you know we are hitting an inflection point here, uh, and oil is going to be more difficult to come by, and we're going to be in a fairly challenged period until we basically recapitalize the oil industry and and go out and start to develop some new fields. Uh, Doomberg's uh, view was look you know people have rang this bell before people have been concerned with peak oil before and we have a remarkable uh, ability to uh, figure things out and to optimize and de-bottleneck and bring on new sources of supply that nobody uh, at at the time uh, could really could really predict or or expect And, and you know we, I sort of joked with my colleague Lee after that, you know, I hope we didn't let people down because we tended to agree on a lot of things and we disagreed on mm-hmm. a few others. And so without going back, and I don't want to, you know, discuss what Doomberg talked about when he's not here because I have a lot of respect for the work that he does and, and prefer to do these discussions with him as opposed sure. to have him be the straw man. But, you know, I think what it really comes down to is that there's been periods in, in the history of oil uh, where... You know, go back to 1970, right? We had a very, very serious oil crisis through the 1970s. We had a very, very serious energy crisis through the 1970s, a rolling set of energy crises. Uh, And it was due to one fact. It was due to the fact that the United States production peaked and rolled over. And, Mm -hmm. you know, people might say, well, no, it had to do with OPEC and the dual uh, embargoes uh, following uh, first uh, the war in Israel and then following the overthrow of the Shah in 1979 in Iran. But the truth of the matter is that if the United States had been producing robustly, if they'd been growing, if they had been bringing on the shales back then, let's say, then you wouldn't have that OPEC oil sword in quite the same way. I mean, we saw this back in 2014 and we saw it again in 2020 and in the 1990s when Venezuela was ramping. You know, when the world's awash in oil, when the call on OPEC begins to decline, OPEC loses pricing power and market share and vice versa. And so 1970, I mean, I think a really, really direct cause of the rolling oil crises was the fact that non-OPEC oil supply led by the U.S. rolled over. Um, again, in 2005, you had a price spike from 11 bucks at 99 to 145 by 2008, and that was largely because non-OPEC as a group was rolling over, right? So the U.S. was then in steady decline. The shales hadn't come on yet, but you were starting to see depletion and issues taking hold in the North Sea, in the Gulf of Mexico, all over. And so if you look at kind of the year-on-year growth in non-OPEC oil supply in that period of time, it was uh, very, very subdued. And once again, strong growth, so OPEC gained market share and pricing power, and they were able uh, to cut production into a tight market. We got this massive, massive, massive spike. Technology improved hugely in both of those periods, right? From mm-hmm. 1970 to 2010, technology improved you know, leaps and bounds. We went from drilling in the shallowest of offshores to drilling in 10,000 feet of water. We went from mm-hmm. drilling um, you know, straight wells at however many feet to now 10,000 foot horizontals and laterals. But that didn't stop 
prices from rising substantially. And the reason, of course, is that oil markets are set all, it's all on the margin. It's the marginal barrel of supply and the marginal barrel of demand. So when you get shifts and major drivers in the oil markets, you're going to get major, major responses. And that's what I think is happening now. The shales unequivocally have been what have saved us for the last 15 years. We've brought on, depending how many NGLs you want to include, 15 million barrels a day of oil from shales plus NGLs in the United States that wouldn't have been available in the market. That's 15% of the global oil market. That's 100% of demand growth in the last 15, 20 years. Okay, mm -hmm. This has been a massive, massive, massive number. And we think that that's now beginning to roll over. And indeed, the data is pointing that out. Shale growth in the United States has been, you know, call it 15 million barrels per day, 15% of global demand, all of non-OPEC oil supply growth, more or less over the last uh, 12 or so years, depends your starting point and ending point, but certainly the vast majority. And we have good reason to believe that that's now in the process of beginning to peak, plateau, and roll over itself. And so I think what you what you saw, again, going back to that chart, you had all these different kind of forms of uh, oil, conventional oil, offshore, what have you, and then this massive, massive, massive spike in uh, tight oil. You know, that was really like a, a, a two separate and distinct systems. And, and one is continuing its Hubbard peak, that's traditional oil. And if you actually look at the total shale oil production, it looks like it's following the left-hand side of a Hubbard peak. You know, if you just mm -hmm. were to isolate that red uh, shaded area there, that actually begins to look like the left-hand side of a bell-shaped curve. So if that's taking place, and we think that it is, and the reason we think it is, is that we have really good proprietary data where we can go and try to determine the recoverable reserves of the shales. Nobody else can do that, and at least nobody that I uh, speak to on a regular basis. I'm sure some, some technical people can. We use machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to take a stab, and it shows that we're, lo and behold, right at 50% in the Permian. We're past 50% in the Eagleford. We're right at 50% in the Bakken, and they were great predictors. Uh, for when the Eagleford rolled over, when the Bakken stopped growing, and when the Permian is now slowed. The, no one realizes the Permian growth started 2023, January, January 23 to January 22. It was up like 900,000 barrels a day. And by the end of the year, the year on your number is like 100,000 barrels a day. So that's growth is slowing really dramatically. And I think it risks mm -hmm. turning negative. And so if you're the only source of growth that begins to turn over, very much in keeping with Hubbard, uh, conjectures, then I think you're going to have a real problem in the oil market next year and the year after. Uh, I don't know what you know the infinite future, the extended future does. You know, I do have a huge amount of faith in people and capital responses to put money into the right place and incentivize the right people, but it's certainly not happening now. Uh, it's certainly mm -hmm. not happening to any degree. Um, and I think we're in for much, much higher oil prices until we reachieve an equilibrium in the global oil uh, energy markets. Yeah, I loved your it was the 2022 fourth quarter report. I read that. I read it twice. And, and because that was where, for the first time, I'd saw that 50% calculation put out. And also you put a time frame. You said, hey, this sort of paints at about 2025, that maybe this begins to flatten out a little bit. Um, and, and it doesn't run out. Again, this is not like, oh, you know, the Permian slurping sounds and it's over. Uh, this is a, a model put out by Dennis Coyne at Peak Oil Barrel. He does a, you know, a... a a sectional tier one, tier two, tier three, how many drillable acres are there? What have we got in reserves? Da, da, da. This is an, uh, an argument that says for the Permian, you know, it, it, it peaks out there sometime around now. And then, you know, by 2040, it's still producing a million barrels a day. That's a quality field by any stretch, um, but it's not growing anymore. And if that's true, I, this, is, this is just me with some Photoshop. I updated Art's chart. That's what this looks like if the Permian is true and if no new giant fields get discovered, say, off the east coast of the United States or, or wherever. But that's what it would look like based on stuff we have. How, tell us about, um, I want to hear more about, about your model and how it goes about developing its view and, and whether it aligns with what I just showed. No, it, al it aligns very closely. Um, and, and I'll talk about it in a second. But, you know, I, I do think that there's one point in distinction uh, because I have, you know, heard people ask about it in the past. And, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I think it bears discussion a little bit. And that has to do, uh, I do think, uh, unfortunately, there are people in the peak oil camp uh, who, who really kind of extrapolate a very, very dire future, right? And, and, and I think that they have a Malthusian bent, and obviously Malthus, for those unfamiliar, was a you know philosopher. I don't know when he wrote. I think the 
17th century, maybe even earlier. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, and, and he basically wrote about, uh, you know, limits to growth before it was called such and the idea of growing exponentially into a finite world and things like that. And why, um, you know, that would be impossible to do on a sustained basis and why ultimately dark days lay ahead. Now, of course, if you compare the world today compared to the world of Malthus, things are infinitely better than they were. The same is true of the Club of Rome in the 1970s that had a very strong Malthusian streak to them. And so I think you do have to be really careful because I, I think that our brightest days lie ahead. Uh, I think that um, we have an unbelievable amount of prosperity and growth. I think probably it's mostly gonna come from nuclear power. If you say, well, how could that be with all this stuff? Um, I think that ultimately long range, based on the efficiency and the low carbon, and nuclear power is really going to be able to save the day. However, you know, we consume 102 million barrels of oil. Uh, the entire growth of that has been on the back of the shales, and the shales are running into trouble. And I don't know how anyone who really studies the numbers hard uh, or, or closely can, can begin to deny that. And so I think that that's a very, very real situation, right? One takes a very, very big picture view and talks about society progressing over hundreds of years. I think that's super interesting, but I think it's misguided to think that society is on a downward trajectory, at least from an energy consumption perspective. Um, but I do think that we're in a really tough spot with global oil markets, global gas markets, and that because of that, we're going to see much, much higher prices. And we might see some, some pretty serious turmoil and pain uh, in, in the interim until we kind of figure are things out. And so I think that's how you kind of bridge those two together, those two views. Now, as far as the shales and why we think that they're going well, well, to... Before, before we go, oh, on, please. I consider myself a, a, a bit of a Malthusian in the sense that I think that it's only half the argument to say there's a math problem. He was really advocating the way I read him to say, and maybe we should put some thought into this. So I am a huge proponent of small modular nuclear reactors. If we could just do the thorium cycle, I'm right there with you. However, we still don't, haven't bridged that gap between, even if we get a lot of electrons flowing out of these tiny, beautiful devices, how do we run container ships? How do we run jets? How do we run trucking fleets? We're not there yet. Can we be honest about that? We don't have any way of running these things yet on electricity. I see a big gap. So that's all I'm arguing for is like, if we can see that we're coming towards the end of like an infinite growth of oil, but we've got capital markets that really like infinite growth of debt, and we haven't sort of plotted that through yet. Now, China's busy plotting this out in a very thoughtful way. Our own energy agency is just like, I don't know what they're up to. Last I heard, Jennifer Granholm said, we're going to run the military. We're going to run tanks on electricity. The gap. Adam, it's huge. That's what I worry about. Um, is I believe humans can solve problems, but first we have to begin to recognize we have a, something we have to solve, and we got to get on it in time to do something useful. So. Oh, I, I, I couldn't agree more. We do have a major, major problem looming here. And, um, you know, what, what's interesting about the, you know, now we're talking really kind of metaphysically, but the, you know, capacity of human ingenuity and human engineering and things like that, you know, I, I would usually bet on the side of the engineers on the long term basis, everyone except the financial engineers. I was joking that the financial engineers are the only engineers who are out there to make problems worse and not make problems better. Um, but yeah. so look, it, it, I, We'll figure out a way, the right way, I, I'm convinced, ultimately, will be, you know, depending on, I suppose, how the country goes and things like that, but it's ultimately the, the solutions are going to come from the United States. The solutions are not going to come from China. I agree that China's energy sensibilities and energy policies right now from a position of extreme uh, vulnerability are more sensible than ours, no two ways about it. But I refuse to believe that over the long term, um, you know, a command and control central economy like China is going to figure this out uh, better than the market will figure it out. However, what I can promise you will not work is the path that we're going down, which is to ignore the problem problem that we have with conventional energy. And, you know, the back of a napkin, you know, a child could do this. Uh, look at the energy return on investment of renewables compared to either hydrocarbons or nuclear. We, we won't fix the problem going down this path. And, you know, this is not a debate on CO2. It's not a debate on global warming. It's a debate on the on the cure. It's a debate on the medicine here. And it, it's just it's running in reverse. So that I can guarantee you will not work. Uh, and, and but I do think ultimately we're going to come to that realization. And I think there'll be a lot of pain in the interim. So, you know, where, where that shakes out anyone's guess. Yeah, it's the scale of it. You know, it's time scale cost, but the scale of this, you know, we're talking quadrillions of terawatt hours that have to be somehow replaced by other means. If we decide, you know, for whatever sets of reasons, we're going to get off of oil and coal, be those geologic reasons, because the climate change people get their way, whatever. 
we, we, this, this chart, you know, which really inflects up there around 1950, this is level ground for everybody watching this. This is what we grew up in. This is, this is just flat territory. But what you're saying and what I'm, I'm here talking about is I think we can see some bumps that, that oil is no longer the driver in that story that it has been up to this point in time. And I, I, cer I certainly w worry about that. Absolutely. And yeah, it'll be and so more costly. Yeah, so I was just talking with a guy with a lot of gray hairs. He's been in the Permian Basin 42 years, and he's an engineer. He's been there, done that. And I was actually looking at the gas-oil ratios beginning to rise, and that, to me, typically in a typical basin says you're closer to the end than the beginning of the story when your gas-oil ratios begin to spike. So I said, hey, is this true, or am I just, is there something different I need to understand? And so he explained the difference between the Delaware Basin, which is deeper and hotter sure. and has more in it and stuff like that. So we went through some details, but he said, no, you're right. Um, people who are thinking that we that we have that we can just keep running the story, he said, guaranteed flat out at the current seventy to eighty dollar band that oil's been in. He said, we're not getting any more out. Goes up to one hundred twenty, we'll get more out. But this is to the to the point of the debate that I had with with Doomberg, you know, with, in print and in video, and you had directly, which is, is peak cheap oil a myth or not? This guy with his all experience, boots on the ground, is telling me we're not getting more out unless the prices go up. That seems like an end to the to the peak cheap oil myth hypothesis. No, I, 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 I think so. And yes, okay, let's get back to, to what our models say, okay? So our models, mm -hmm. what we did is we built a neural network. Uh, we did this, I don't know, gosh, six, six years ago probably. So, so we, you know, we call it AI or we call it machine learning. It, it doesn't bear much resemblance to chat GPT. We don't sit there and converse with this and, you know, get answers spit back at us. But what we did do yeah. is we built a very, very sophisticated model to try to answer a question which was really prevalent at the time. And the question was basically this. Between, you know, 2014 and 2016, Saudi Arabia tanked the oil markets. Prices collapsed. We stopped drilling. Prices kind of firmed in 2016 at 27. They started to move higher. And all of a sudden, the shales just came roaring back. And it didn't match anyone's expectations, right? Mm -hmm. The productivity of the wells had just ballooned in the last couple years prior to that. And we started to see this massive supply response. And if you look, you know, the best years of shale were kind of that 17, 18, and 19 period. And they were taking place with a fairly low rig count by historical standards and by not particularly strong oil prices. And so the common theme and narrative among, in the industry was that, look, you know, we spent those two years in the wilderness just kind of hunkering down and getting really good at drilling these wells. We figured out every trick in the book, uh, every optimization tool, and now we just drill much better wells than we did before. And that was being countered by people at the time, most notably Mark Papa, who had been the old CEO of EOG, saying we're running out of our best areas, we're moving into second tier mm -hmm. areas, and they're half as good. So we'd wanted to build a model. We said, okay, we have two factors. One's presumably pushing it up, which is productivity enhancements based on the industry. One's pulling it down, which is we're moving from tier one to tier two. How can we try to figure that out? As anybody knows, uh, a mathematical model with two interacting factors, one's moving up, one's moving down, they're not linear, it's a mess. And so we tried to build some early models to try to get us, it was okay, fine. Let's assume a tier two is half as good as a tier one. Let's assume you get 80% marginal incremental improvements on you know whatever lateral length and frac prop and loadings and stuff like that. Can we kind of back into the observed numbers that we're seeing? And we did a halfway decent job. And I think that's what everyone was doing uh, at the time. Uh, but we wanted to, to know more, right? And so we built this neural network and it basically took a series of inputs, which is how the well is drilled and where the well is drilled. And we had the output of the model be the production profile of the well. And based on all these new technologies and all these new code bases and stuff like that, you can do these very, very efficiently and you can do them very, very quickly. So we could run data on every shale well that had ever been drilled and we could use it to then make projections about every shale well that ever would be drilled, right? By being able to kind of locate them in uh, areas that, of undevelopment and stuff like that. And the conclusion was 100% the opposite of the industry. So the industry was saying, look, we're getting really good at drilling every well mitigated by moving from tier one to tier two, what we noticed was people were staying really constant with how they were drilling their wells, but they were rushing into tier one areas. And that explained basically 85% of the increase in the productivity over that time. We said, well, wow, this is a really, really different conclusion mm -hmm. because if you take the industry at face value and you're turning tier two areas into basically what had been tier one only a year before, that's really bearish and deflationary because now all of a sudden you're, you're available 
uh, high quality inventory areas uh, has gone up. But we noted that it was the opposite. What you were seeing was hollowing out of your best areas, what you would call high grading in the mining industry. Mm -hmm. And so we realized that, in fact, we were rushing towards this peak uh, and rushing towards this potential moment of trouble. So from there, we were able to then hypothesize what every well going forward would produce. We had really good R-squareds, uh, really, really predictive models, um, much better than anything I had ever worked with before. And everyone in AI kind of talks about this aha moment, you know, where it almost seems magical. And I think we all know what that feels like now with chat GPT, right? Where there, yep. you know, it all, it almost hits this moment of saying like, wow, that, that was really better than I expected. Um, and, and we felt the same and we used it to predict every future location. And with that, what had been produced, what will be produced, we made an estimate for the total recoverable reserves of the field. And the first thing that we noticed was in the Barnett and the Fayetteville, the two early gas fields, they had peaked and rolled over and they did it exactly where our model would have said 50% of the recoverable reserves had been produced. And wow, that's pretty interesting. What does it tell us for the other fields? And so far, I have to say, you know, 2024 will be a really good test to see what the Permian does. But so far, uh, our hit rate has been 100% and talking about fields that will be able to grow and fields that frankly won't. Um, and, and I think that that's really telling. So going forward, it looks now like the Permian is in a world of trouble. It's probably not going to see much more growth. Maybe we'll get a couple sequential months, but I wouldn't be surprised if the monthly peak is made in 2024. And I'll be perfectly honest, if it's not, then I will have to go back and readjust models. You know, I change my mind when things change, but as of now, that's, that's my firm conviction. Um, the Marcellus is the interesting one because everyone thinks that's pipeline takeaway capacity constraints. We don't really see that. If you look at the recoverable really? reserves there, it's awfully close to 50%. Uh, the Eagleford wow. is very clearly passed, and that's why it's just a, a, a relic of its former self. The Barnett, the Fayetteville, clearly they're not coming back. Uh, and the and the Bakken has been interesting. The Bakken's confounded me the last few months. It's still below its pre-shale peak or pre-COVID peak, but it's been growing more than I would have expected. And we've seen a lot of duck liquidation there in the last few months. And so I'm going to reserve judgment till maybe mid-year 24 to see what's going on there. I would suspect that's going to slow again too. Yeah. What about um, the odd duck in this whole story for me is the Haynesville. Um, clearly rolled over and came right back. Uh, do yeah. you have a story for that one? I have a great story for that one, Chris. Thanks for setting me up. Um, huh. So what's interesting is, and, and I'll be fully transparent, we did not have these models back in 2014, I think is when it peaked the first time. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish we did, uh, but we didn't. And the Haynesville ramped up super aggressively from zero to eight or nine Bs, like, really, like overnight. Um, and then it rolled over very, very sharply. And, and this is going to get to a really interesting question about price versus geology, which I think is, is so critical because he said something before that I want to take issue with. Um, so peak rolled over. Everyone kind of forgot about it. And then it just staged this massive comeback and made a massive second high, much greater than the first high. So if you would have actually looked at the Haynesville, no change in the uh, aerial extent. So we're not now bolting on new areas. The same Haynesville that we all know. And if you had looked at it back in 2014 when it peaked originally, it was only 25% recovered. So it had only produced 25% of the recoverable reserves. So this type of an analysis, right, which is really a conjunction of two things, neural networks being able to identify the total recoverable reserves, and then the oldest, le less, least proved math, you know, wonky math in the world, Hubbard curve, putting those together to try to make big predictions uh, at the basin levels. If you would have done that back in 2014, which we did not do, it was very clear that you were going to be able to grow that field again. That's not really the case anymore. You're not quite at 50%, but you're like at 46, 47, 48, all right? And so you're getting there pretty quickly. And so I would say that's probably, you know, maybe you can grow in 24, but I think by 25, growth will be hard to find there uh, too. Now, I wish I'd known that back in 2014 because I was really expecting the Haynesville, you know, who, who expects the field to make this massive new recovery? I think it was predictable, though, and, and I'm glad, frankly, that our models, you know, which we're using to make these predictions, would have called the kind of false top back then. It would have said, mm. no, no, th this has room to go. Uh, it gives me a little bit more comfort that, you know, it's not just saying everything's going to roll over all the time type of a thing. But now yeah. I want to talk about something really quickly that you brought sure. up before, which was the idea, well, if oil prices go higher, then maybe we'll see more come out of the Permian, right? And we mm -hmm. get this, asked this question a lot. They say, well, is it not just a matter of price? And so if you're bullish on oil, 
um, then, then all of a sudden price will go up and you'll bring on new fields uh, or new parts of the Permian and then production will roll back over again. And the, it, it's a really complicated uh, question. Again, you know, rise massively like tenfold X oil price rises in 19... Uh, 70 to 1980 and then again in 1999 to 2008 they didn't immediately bring on all this like new production so i think the first thing is is this time lag where it's not as though prices rise and you see the response straight away they did create a ton of cash flow in the industry both those cycles that cash flow was reinvested and ultimately we did grow supply right so that is true kind of over the, the what economists would think the medium or the long term but in the short term it doesn't necessarily hold it's not like you kind of have that well sitting right over there and oil hits 100 and, and all of a sudden production comes surging back online but even more kind of philosophically and conceptually right imagine you have an oil field mm -hmm. and imagine the oil field has no constraints whatsoever you have capital you have equipment you have takeaway capacity everything like that right and imagine that oil's 75 bucks and everyone can make a 20% rate of return and life's pretty good. And then oil prices fall. Obviously, production in that field will decline. People will stop drilling wells and the current production will start to decline and your overall field production will start to decline. And then if oil goes to 150, well then not only will they get back to work, but they'll get back to work even faster because they'll have more cash that's recycling more quickly. So very, very, very clearly, the rate in which a, production, a hypothetical field will produce depends on the price. Now imagine another field where oil prices stay at 70 bucks forever. Uh, again, no equipment shortages, no capital market shortages. The guys will go get after it, they'll bring in wells, and they'll produce, 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 probably follow some type of a Hubbard peak, right, until there's no reserve left, like seriously nothing left in the whole basin. And then all of a sudden, Price is doubled to 200 bucks. What's that field going to do? Well, it's not going to do anything. There's nothing left there to produce. So very, very clearly, production profiles of fields depends on geology and not on price. But I just said it depends on price and not geology. So what gives? Mm -hmm. The role of the oil analyst, as far as I'm concerned, is to determine where in that spectrum we are. It's not a, it's not a black or white issue. Price determines the uh, ultimate production rates of these fields, and geology determines the ultimate production rates of these fields. We saw that in the Haynesville. Circa 2014, you were on the side of that curve where price really dictated everything. You had the geology, but price didn't give you the right incentives. I worry that now we're on the other side where the geology is going to be the constraining issue. And so price will have an impact, but it'll be on the margin, and it's not going to have this massive supply response. That's my worry, and that's what I think the opportunity is for oil investors. Well, Thank you for that. I, I see the same opportunity, but I want to widen this to macro. My concern is that when we saw that big slam down in 2016, who remembers negative oil prices, whatever that means, right? Um, but, but things really got trunk crushed, right? And all anybody has to do is pull up uh, the share price for Transocean, RIG, R-I-G, um, and you'll see what happened. Our offshore capabilities got obliterated. And not just obliterated like the you know, companies are hollow shells of what they used to be, but when I talk to people in the industry, Adam, they tell me that um, a lot of experience left. And so you talked about capital and, you know, other shortages, materials. But labor is, is another, particularly in this sort of a very high tech field. I'm worried that we're missing one to two to three trillion dollars of, of capital investment in oil that didn't happen between 2016, 17, 18, 19, 20. It just wasn't happening in no small measure because U.S. was busy pumping as fast as it could and, and flooding the market, keeping prices down. But um, what are your thoughts there in terms of globally? Uh, what would it take for the world maybe to begin to, uh, how much would it have to invest and how long would that take before we could see a meaningful change in the supply dynamic? The numbers are really big. And, and I think, you know, anyone trying to put numbers to it to some extent is guessing a little bit right mm -hmm. but if you just look at the number of petroleum engineers being graduated in the united states it's woefully low um i know doomberg was saying that china is graduating more i'm sure that's true uh, but nevertheless if you look just at the total market capitalization of the oil and gas industry which has always throughout time averaged 12 percent and in periods uh, of supply shortages tends to spike up to about 30 percent you know now you're sitting you can't break five and now you're back down you can't even break four you're at 3.8 percent of the s p 500 if you look at the mm -hmm. brussels it's no different if you look internationally it's no different so we've massively starved this industry for capital 
and all that money needs to come back in. And I think you're right. It is in the order of magnitude of trillions of dollars. Um, and, and I think that it doesn't, you know, first of all, you don't move trillions of dollars overnight, even though we've debased currencies and a dollar isn't what it was before. A trillion dollars is still a lot of money. A billion might not be anymore, but a trillion is still a lot of money. Um, and, and, and you need to ramp back up, I do think, the human element uh, side of things um, as well. Now, again, you know, that's just going to create more near-term dislocations and more shortages. And it's really acute. And you know, if somebody thinks that this stuff doesn't matter, just look at the nuclear power business. You know, Everyone talks about these really, really high costs of nuclear electricity, nuclear power. And what they're quoting often are a few very large projects, you know, two in the United States with Vogel um, in, in South Carolina, uh, that came in three times over budget, four times over budget, and, and you know, a decade late. And that is largely because we don't have people to do these jobs anymore. You know, we don't have, you know, the major bottleneck at that project was welding and laying of concrete. Now, obviously, not just concrete. regular way welding, yeah, and laying of mm -hmm. concrete to a very high specification. We just can't do it anymore, right? And so the oil and gas business is not the same as nuclear engineering, but it's, it's the same principles that are at play. We have just really hollowed out our knowledge base. We don't do this stuff anymore. Um, we have high graded our people too, right? So the people presumably that are left in the industry are probably some of the more talented ones that you could afford to pay more, I would suspect. And what do you do when you need to ramp up production and ramp up activity? It's gonna be a real shock to people, I think, uh, how, how, how challenging some of these things are to recover and respond. And, and this raises an important point, which is the narrative structure. So we, we've told ourselves some things that maybe weren't totally true. So the nuclear industry got hamstrung by, you know, the movie, The China Syndrome, which was based off of, you know, Three Mile Island and, and all of that. And, and I think now, many decades later, I'm sure I fell for it at the time, like, ah, nuclear. Now I look at it, I'm like, wow, safest industry I know about when it comes to energy production by far, even with its few, few missteps. Our narrative structure right now is two things have been just rampant in the press, and I've hated both of them. I think they're falling apart in real time as we're recording this, is EVs are going to save us, okay? Well, now some bloom has come off the rose, and people are starting to go, oh, okay, this, these aren't quite what we thought. They're, they're good, but not the magic panacea. And the second is this idea that there's going to be peak oil demand because of this rapid adoption of EVs, which are just going to take off. Can, can you speak to the demand side of the story? Us now. You, you have nothing to worry about for demand for energy in general and oil in particular for the next 15 years. Demand is going to be a major problem probably around 2050, and I'll, and I'll tell you why. Everyone has a really, really, really backwards understanding of energy demand. And I'm going to say energy demand instead of oil demand, because when we talk about oil demand, it's really a function of energy demand and then EV penetration. So I'm gonna talk about the EVs at the end, okay, and why they're not the silver bullet or panacea. Mm -hmm. However, I think even more upstream from that, let's just look at energy broadly defined, because the big IEA and the powers that be, they also, not only do they say we're gonna hit peak oil, they say we're actually gonna peak, hit peak energy. When you look at energy per capita between mm -hmm. now and 2050, they expect it'll be down I think it's like two, no, I'm sorry, I think it's 10% and 2% total um, with population growth. So 10% per capita, 2% total. That is ridiculous. It's beyond ridiculous, okay? And, and, and here, here's the reason why. Everybody in their model treats energy demand as you know the output. They say, okay, we're going to grow GDP by 3%. And then we're going to have 10% improvement in energy efficiency. And so then our energy demand is going to be whatever that works out to be. It's backwards. The energy availability determines what our GDP growth is going to be. Thank you. Energy, the economy and everything in the economy is just energy transformed from one form into another. There's seriously nothing that is not that. And I would go so far, which I think we're probably in the same camp on this, that I think that you could recast real GDP and units of useful energy to measure the economy. I think that GDP is an abstraction that basically represents uh, the, the consumption of useful energy. And, and so when you think about that and you think about the, the, the way in which that causality flows, it, it's like saying, it, it's like saying um, you know, wealth and, and, and prosperity or something like that. Like we're gonna, we're gonna target prosperity and then we'll need a certain amount of wealth to fix. No, it's the other way around. You accumulate the wealth and then that leads to the prosperity. And that's exactly what's gonna happen here. So if we all of a sudden, you know, 
see energy become more abundant, then we're going to grow faster and we're going to grow into that and consumption is going to skyrocket. If on the other hand, and, and GDP, if on the other hand, we're in a period of time where energy is scarce, then GDP won't be able to grow as much. So when you look at the IEA numbers, I'm going to pick on them for a little bit because I think mm -hmm. they're worthy of being picked on. But when you look at the IEA, you know, we have energy efficiency improvements. We've had huge energy efficiency improvements. Um, if you go back to the original Watt steam engine and you look at what we're doing today, it's, I mean, it's like night and day. If you look for over the last 30 years at mileage standards on cars, they've gone from 9 to 40 miles per gallon. We have massive efficiency. We're going to continue. It will never result in lower per capita energy demand. You'll get the efficiency, but the total demand will grow. Total GDP will grow. If, you're, if your energy per units of GDP fall, your total GDP will grow to fill that gap. And we will never, mark my words, outside of a recession or short-term blip, never see lower consumptions of per capita energy. Now, that's even doubly true, okay? And, and I have a great chart, and maybe, maybe I don't know how this technology works, but I can send it to you and you can maybe edit it in afterwards. If not, I can point your viewers to where you can find it. You can share screen if you want to get bold with it, give it a go. Uh, have a, I'm not sure if I have it on me here. No, let's let's just keep talking. Okay, I, so I can talk my way we'll, through it we'll, and I'll send we'll it We'll weave out. it in. Okay. Fine. Um, you know, you look at global energy efficiency, which is to say how much GDP per unit of energy. It gets better and better and better, meaning energy per unit of GDP goes down and down and down. But then you break it apart and you say, okay, well, what does that look like in the developed world and what does it look like in the poorer countries? And they're two completely different charts. Now, they both trend down and down and down and down. So everyone's getting better. Everyone's getting more efficient. But a poor industrializing economy still consumes, I don't know, twice the amount of energy per GDP that we do. We flatten out when we get really, really rich and prosperous. But as you develop, the energy demands are huge. So you go back to 1980, 1990, 1950 even, the percent of the world's energy demand, the percent of the world's GDP in the rich countries was much more. It was like 70% kind of eyeballing those numbers. And now it's really, really shifted. So the world energy efficiency is the weighted average of the two, and it's getting pulled up and pulled up and pulled up. And you can see it really, really well when you look at, at the data. And that's going to continue going forward. Um, so the question then becomes, well, how many people are going through that really, really weighty, meaty part of their development, right? I mean, presumably, if, if every incremental person you add, if they're in a rich country, their energy per GDP will be lower than a poor country. You need to see where the growth is coming from. And it's coming dramatically from the, rich, uh, from the poor countries. And when you look at how many people are in that phase of their development, you'll notice something really interesting. For most of the 20th century, it was fairly constant at about 500 million people. So, you know, Japan would enter in and maybe France would fall off. And then all of a sudden Japan would go through its process and then it would fall off and Korea would come on. And so you'd get a pretty fairly stable number. And then obviously beginning in the early 2000s with China, but now Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, India is the big wild card. You're up to about three to four billion people going through that meaty part of what we call the S-curve, you know, the, the, the really energy intensive part of their development. So, so demand is your friend. Demand is a massive tailwind. And that's why we see this over and over again. After 2008, with the big global financial crisis, demand, you know, in past recessions, demand would fall 10% peak to trough and take nearly a decade to recover. After the GFC, much worse than any of the other crises uh, from an economic perspective, oil demand fell by 1.8% and took 18 months peak to trough. Okay. Which is not, not the same. COVID, Everyone thought 2019 was the all-time high for energy and oil demand and that coming back out of COVID, yeah, we would come back and normalize, but never at the rates we saw. 2022 set the new record. I mean, you couldn't have been wronger faster. And it's because you have this, this tsunami, this groundswell of people in poor countries that are very, very energy consumptive. Now, I'm going to make a really far out long-term prediction, okay? Because people say, well, isn't this just a cycle? Yeah, it's a cycle. We're going to go through 10 years of pain because we have not capitalized the energy industry enough. People by 2030 or 2035 are going to consider energy to be must own. Like Schlumberger was the must own mm -hmm. stock in 1980. You know, energy stocks were 30% of the S&P. Everyone, the argument to make why you should own energy stocks in a bull market is stronger than why you shouldn't in a bear market, right? You know, we need it for everything. We're not going to get away from this stuff. Let's just put some in. Mm -hmm. And we will bring on all that production just as that cohort of humanity develops out and falls out the other side of the S-curve. And we can't replace it. The numbers aren't there. This is a unique moment in time. 
in the whole evolution of the human species, we don't, we never will, never have had more people developing in the energy intensive part of their development is today. And so I think it's just like laughable that everyone worries about demand all the time. It's just, this is the one moment you don't have to worry about demand. And then you will at some point again, probably, like I said, somewhere in the 2030s. Uh, thank you for all of that. It's brilliantly said. And, and it's, uh, again, I, I'm, I'm that guy. Like, can you point to this chart where this demand is rolling over? Because every year, it's just more and more and more and more. And of course, it makes sense. If you travel the world at all, you'll see, I, used to, I put on what I call my energy goggles. It's like when, you know, when Neo finally sees the matrix in the hallway, right? Once you see things through the energy, I just see energy, right? You fly over these, you know, when I was, I never was in Beijing when they were in their bicycle period, but I was there when they were there with their, um, with their automobile period, and it was just crammed. And now they've switched over to, you know, electric trikes and bikes and things to a large extent. That's cool. But watching that explosion, unbelievable watching them come online. And, and, and of course, everybody wants to live not a high consumptive lifestyle, but at least a middle class lifestyle, because let's face it, it's an awesome lifestyle, right? So 3 billion people coming online. That is the story for the next, well, it's got to be a couple decades, right? 10, 15 years, 20 years? At least. It's going to take time. And, 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 and I'll tell you, once all those people reach the middle class, I bet you anything that they're going to want a high consumptive lifestyle. Yep. Of course they will. Of course they will. So, so the peak oil demand story, but the IEA deserves a little, they, they've been pushing that that peak demand narrative for quite a while. And I've never quite understood it. And I want them to show me their math, but they never quite do. Um, on that whole thing, but it just defies what I would call just common sense. <laughs> no, it, it does, and and you know their, their, their math their math is interesting because it's simple, but but it's just wrong, and they should know better. I mean, they they study the energy markets. Um, you know, yeah. their, their their math is is population growth, which you know that that's awfully difficult to predict. But I don't think their their estimates are. are entirely unreasonable. Uh, mm -hmm. When you look at their GDP growth figures, you know, the GDP growth figures um, seem like they could be plausible and reasonable. And when you look at the, you know, year on year or compounded year on year efficiency improvements, they start to get a lot better. But they say, look, we're, we're doing stuff, you know, an EV harnesses energy more efficiently than an electric vehicle, which I don't agree or than an IC, which I don't agree with. But you know, I think that's the perception and, you know, we're moving to more energy efficient forms of heating and cooling, although that's not really going to be what saves us. Right. So you have this efficiency that kind of like hooks better on a year on year basis, but, you know, it doesn't seem like it could be entirely implausible. Mm -hmm. The problem is the conclusions that they reach, which is that they then have efficiency gains outpacing GDP growth such that total aggregate energy falls. That can't happen. It's what's known as Jevons paradox and Jevon, uh, I, I, we refer to him as Dr. Jevon. I went back and looked. I don't know that he has a PhD, so he might just be Mr. Jevon. He might be Lord Jevon for all I know. I don't know. But he was an English uh, economist back in the mm -hmm. 18th century. And he noticed that as, you know, the steam engines, right, at the time, Britain was worried that it was running out of coal. And so the improvements in efficiency of the steam engine was dramatic, orders of magnitude, right, as, as engineers got to work and figured it all out. And Jevon noticed something that I think is so profound and nobody talks about. He noticed that with that huge order of magnitude improvement of uh, steam engine efficiencies, coal demand in England surged. It didn't collapse, it surged. Why? Well, he made it more efficient, so everyone went out and started to use it. I mean, and it's really as simple as that. You know, microeconomics captures it really well, if the cost of something goes down, uh, a firm or a household will, 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 will consume more of it. But somehow it gets lost. By, by, it starts out at Microeconomics 101, and by the time you're at the Energy and Information International Energy Agency, uh, it's completely been transmorphed into efficiency is going to result in lower energy demand. It's just fundamental. It's never happened, and it's never going to happen. We, if we have all of a sudden the ability, you know, if all of a sudden – you, you developed a plane that was 90% more efficient. United ordered 200 of them. It wouldn't be United. It would probably be, you know, Singapore Air or something like that. Um, and, and what would happen? Like what, like, what do people think would happen? The cost of the ticket would fall and people, air travel would surge. And we would consume far more energy in travel under that situation than what we have now. So it's just, it's just a really, really basic misunderstanding, I think, of how things work. Um, and it'll just catch people off guard. Yeah, I love Jevon's paradox. Thanks for, for bringing that into the conversation. Because if you gave me like half a cent per kilowatt hour electricity, I'd probably do something dumb with it, like drill a second well and heat it up. So I would heat my aquifer, hot water out of the ground. You know, we'd find some 
very creative way to use super cheap, you know, electricity, something like that. Maybe, so maybe you might to, you might find bit mine Bitcoin. Maybe even, but I don't know. That yeah, we'll see. <laughs> there there are limits, Adam, to this conversation. So to to finish this out, just I think to put the cherry on top. So you mentioned it before, the EROI, the energy return and energy invested of green energy, so-called green energy thing. Like, like I keep reading these headlines again, the narrative structure is wind now cheaper than coal. And I say, well, if that was true, why are all these wind companies going out of business even with subsidies? I can't hmm. square that circle. Can you help us make sense of that? Sure. Um, levelized cost of electricity is a, is a very, very misleading metric. Um, and it has all kinds of issues and, and problems uh, with it. Um, obviously, as, as you very rightly picked up anecdotally, if you had something that was really efficient and really cheap, it probably would be quite popular as opposed to like the UK where it went no bid for their offshore wind auction last when, August or July or whatever it was. Um, and, and here's how you kind of reconcile the two. Okay, um, The reason the energy return on investment of wind and solar I guess, let me, let me make it really simple. How can you have something that's really bad EROI and really good LCOE? Well, what's the difference between the two? Money's the difference between the two. And so if you have something that's really low EROI, like wind and solar both are, and the engineers kind of agree on that, uh, then the amount of energy required to generate the power goes up and up and up and up. If that energy in turn is extremely cheap, it's not going to have a huge impact on your LCOE. And that's basically the world that we lived in for the last 10 or 15 years, right, with the exception of the last two. You saw a huge reduction in energy costs in the 2010s. And then the other major driver of LCOE is capital cost, meaning the interest rates, because these things are very capital intensive up front, right? You pay for it all up front. <clears throat> and then your ongoing running costs are obviously less than a gas plant or a coal plant where you have to buy the fuel every month. You pay for it all up front. It's all embedded. All that energy is embedded uh, when you first set it up. Now, wind and solar also have maintenance, which everyone likes to sweep under the rug. But even with that accounted for, I mean, you know, when you account for the cost of the fuel, it costs more every day that the plant is open to run a coal plant than it does to run a windmill. But the capital cost was massive up front to build all that, right? And so you have to carry that capital charge with you through the life of the asset and the interest associated with the capital through the life of the asset in the LCOE calculations. So what did the 2010s also have? It had the lowest cost of capital in human history. So you had the lowest real energy prices in human history, and you had the lowest cost of capital in human history. And what did you get? Well, on an LCOE basis, the energy machines that were very capital intensive and very capex intensive, uh, capital intensive and energy intensive, went down. Oh, well, yeah. No, 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 no two ways about it. So, so then the question is, okay, well, look, if you want to normalize some of these over the long term and you want to say, I think that energy prices are too low and this is not so much now and we're talking two years ago and you say, okay, at zero interest rates, I think that that's probably too low. What will that do to the LCOE of wind and solar? And the conventional wisdom was that LCOE has moved in one direction for wind and solar and that's down based on some kind of a perverse Moore's law that no one could really articulate. Um, and we instead said, well, if you run a really simple model and you say how much of the LCOE was responsible for cheap energy and how much was from cheap capital and you normalize those, we said actually it's going to go up quite a bit. And remember that a couple of years ago you weren't even competitive. You certainly weren't competitive with backup storage and with no subsidies. So you needed further improvements for this stuff to really take off. And now we have that. Now we have normalized energy and we have normalized capital costs. And you have wiped out, I just did the math the other week, you have wiped out eight years of efficiency gains in solar in one year. And you'll wipe out the rest uh, another 10, uh, five or six years um, this year too would be my would be my suspicion you did that by just normalizing energy. what happens if energy gets expensive what happens if all of a sudden inflation because of expensive energy results in interest rates that are above average right i think that you could see these things fall dramatically out of the money so that that's the bridge between eroi and levelized cost of electricity the bridge is the cost of the input eroi tells you that the input requires much more input per unit of output but to translate that into dollars, you need to know the cost of the input. And it was really low for a long time. Yeah. And, I, you know, I, people always ask me, you know, what, what would change my tune on alternative energy like that? And it's just it's storage. We just don't the storage just isn't there yet at scale. Right. Yeah. So 
Well, the storage certainly isn't there at scale. There's a couple companies trying to do it. Um, we are actually, for full disclosure, invested in one that has some interesting things. Lithium ion will not be the answer. That that's for sure. Um, mm. It's it's ill suited to say nothing of its costs. Uh, but there's some other technologies that could hold promise. But I got to tell you that you know even if they were successful, you know the upstream EROI is so bad that like yeah, if you put if you take the unbuffered wind and solar and you put a lithium ion battery, we I mean, forget it. You're better off using a windmill from the 16th century, I would think at that point to do your work and mill your flour and stuff like that. But, you know, if you get a really efficient battery, is that going to fix the upstream problem? I don't think it does. So, um, yeah, I think storage helps to unlock stuff. I think storage, you know, in really productive renewable areas uh, would be a bit of a game changer. But um, even with that, I don't see this working out. The other thing that LCOEs get really wrong uh, is, is nuclear power. They, they refer to nuclear power as by far the most expensive source of energy, and that's a more interesting one. Why all of a sudden, if its EROI is so great, are its LCOEs so low? And the answer there is a little bit more complicated in one facet and a little easier in the other. On one hand, um, like I said, we're kind of at like first of a kind reactors at this point. You know, you, if you were to go, there's really a couple, only a couple companies that, that could even begin to do it, and maybe not even any in the West. So, like you look at Korea and China, and they're bringing on nuclear at lower LCOEs that get published because they're at scale. They have a scale nuclear business. So that's number one. But number two is that you look at the life of the asset, and I think in most cases the L, the life of the asset for an LCOE comparison for nuclear is like 20 years. And these things operate for 80 years, right? So if you spend all this money up front and you amortize it over the total output of the plant, it makes a big difference if that plant goes for 20 years or 80 years, right? Uh, and I think that's what you're seeing. Because again, that has n- almost no fuel needs. I mean, so little, de minimis. So that, that's kind of like wind and solar in a way. It's all upfront capital. And if you amortize that over a 20-year life instead of over an 80-year life, um, it's a big mm-hmm. difference. Now, do you think it's possible that, that the United States will, um, and the West in general, will, will sort of wake up and reinvigorate its nuclear industry? Or is it so. too hard? No, I don't think so. Look, I, I, think, I think the United States it, it remains, even today, I'm Canadian, so I'm a bit of an outsider, but um, the United States remains incredibly dynamic. Its markets remain unbelievably vital. Uh, and, and, you know, the ability to put capital in the right parts of the economy, you know, I... I guess the question is, do you think with the ails of society today, we're kind of at a low point uh, in a cycle, or do you think things get a lot worse? But I mean, if the United States does what it does right, and you have this ability to take advantage of really cheap, really efficient, really clean energy, I think we're going to do it. Um, you know, I don't know when. It does seem like sentiments improved quite a bit for, towards nuclear in the past. I hope that continues. Um, but you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. The, the reason we haven't thus far is that we've had reliable, cheap energy in the form of hydrocarbons. Uh, And we didn't care about the carbon of it. So, you know, even if you were convinced that nuclear power made sense, given how efficient hydrocarbons are, not as efficient as nuclear, but but still very, very efficient, you know, I I can almost understand why why we kind of just kept going down the path. It didn't cost us so much, right? But the idea now, if we want to be cognizant of the carbon that goes out, it's either renewables or nuclear, and then there's just no debate. One one can't sustain the modern world, and the other would see unbounded, nearly unlimited prosperity going forward. So I think eventually we have to come to that conclusion. After we've exhausted all the other options? (laughs) I'm I'm an optimist. I think think we'll get there. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, good. Well, thank you so much for your time today. I I love having these detailed conversations and the context matters. So you've been very generous with your time. Um, Adam, can you tell us anything about your firm and and, uh, what, how people can follow your work? Yeah, sure. You mentioned it earlier. We have a website. Uh, The nice thing about Gehring and Rosenzweig is that if you spell it even a third of the way right, Google will point you in the right direction. The website is Go Rosen. Uh, we're on Twitter and LinkedIn and all that good stuff. We do a ton of podcasts too. Uh, and I should point out, you know, for those uh, that are that are just getting to know us a little bit, you know, we're not research providers, and that's why our research is all free. Uh, we're actually institutional money managers, and so we have uh, a variety of investment products. And you know, poke around the website and see what's there. Okay. Well, great. Thank you very much for that. And I would love to have another conversation about some of my favorite other subjects like copper and other places where I'm seeing, oh my gosh, um, some stories there. So with that, Adam, thank you so much for your time today. Again, really appreciate it. Thank you.